Welcome, everyone, to this final session just on this day, and then I'm hoping we all can um, keep going for one more. Um, I'm Catherine Mieser. Uh, Anna Gret and I are part of are the team that um, entice these incredible people to come. Um, and this performing art is a performing art 03 competing agenda and agencies paths of Japanese popular music in the 1970s. Ah, my era. Um, <laughs> I, li um, I live in California, so it's, a, it's sort of an odd time of day, but perfect for 70s music. Um, and I teach at the University of California, Berkeley, and I'm very interested in all kinds of popular culture, in particular dance, but then again, dance is also music. And I've also done work in um, gender and, and performance, and particularly uh, the onagata. And um, any woman artist is a good subject. Um, and I'd like to pass this on and have Anagret um, introduce herself. And then after that, let me just say so um, Lori um, will take over. It's the, he's the part of the team that put this together. And we will have all the papers or presenters in various forms. And then we'll follow with incredible questions um, and a party. Okay, take it away. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you, Catherine. I'm the co-convener of this uh, performing arts section. I work at uh, Tokyo University teaching traditional Japanese theater um, and doing research on uh, production and basically kabuki and um, yeah. <laughs> Please, Laurie, that's all I want to say. Please, Laurie, take over. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Catherine and Annegret, for uh, accommodating our panel uh, as part of this uh, very exciting performing arts uh, uh, section. And indeed, hello to everyone. Good evening, good day, uh, good morning, good night. Uh, thank you for joining us wherever you are. Uh, I think we have this, even within our panel, small panel, we have this bridge going from Kansai er area in Japan to all the way to Connecticut. Uh, I'm Lauri Kitsnik, and on behalf of our panel, I would like to warmly welcome you. Uh, now, this conference has already convinced me uh, that the study of popular music in Japan is alive and well. Uh, we had two great presentations on Wednesday, uh, and I think uh, Anita is here. I'm not sure if uh, Chris has been able to join us, maybe we'll join later. Uh, but I would definitely like to uh, ask you to actively participate in the discussion later on. And in many ways, we would like to pick up from where you took us the other day or rather to take a small step back because before we begin a brief comment uh, about the time frames that we have set for ourselves namely the 1970s and i hope i'm not wrong if i claim that in japanese studies in general this period is perhaps not has not perhaps received quite the same attention as the decades preceding and following it and at the same time uh, I believe 1970s can be identified as a transitional moment, uh, sitting somewhat uneasily uh, between the two seemingly more characteristic decades. And then you have, we, we have the 1960s that saw Japan rejoining the international community by the Olympic Games and, and so on. But also there was this considerable internal struggle against this existing social order. On the other hand, we have the 1980s characterized by Japan's enhanced global presence. And in terms of global flows, popular music also relate, uh, the global flows of popular music, this also relates to the idea of big in Japan that Chris Hu talked about uh, the other day. Uh, but so compared to what preceded and followed it, the 1970s seemed to be a bit more tricky to pin down. Uh, and partly because a number of seemingly contradictory developments that were taking place, many of which, however, ended up shaping the landscape of Japanese popular music as we uh, know it today. And if we look uh, at such agendas or trends that indeed we intend to do in our four papers, uh, we cannot really draw ne neat lines between uh, concepts such as conservative and uh, innovative, reactionary, progressive, and so on. So often it seems that both of these Polls are happening at the same time, 
as if the music's commercial potential coexisted with its capacity to undermine the existing templates. But while we will today be presenting four distinct case studies of rather diverse practices and agencies in the field of popular music in Japan, more than anything, I think we're trying to think back and imagine ourselves living in the 1970s while listening to the soundtrack of that era. And I think not many of us have been able to do this, and I would uh, like to invite everyone present here to join us, uh, imagining us in this different era. But enough of these introductory remarks. Uh, our four papers should be able to speak for themselves. Uh, a few remarks before we begin. Uh, one is about the order of our papers. Uh, we would like to revert back to the way how we originally planned it and how we uh, submitted our proposal. So first there will be uh, uh, Mike Fermanovsky, then I think me, uh, then uh, Scott Olgard, and then finally uh, Lasse Lehton. And unfortunately Lasse just wrote us three hours ago to say that he's not feeling well enough to present, but however he has sent his, uh, he has made available his uh, PowerPoint, so we will somehow improvise together to uh, bring his ideas uh, to you. Uh, on, on a positive note, this has opened up a bit time for us, so I would encourage my fellow panelists to uh, take up to 20 minutes uh, to do their uh, presentations. Uh, uh, and one more thing, of course, our session is being recorded. Uh, so, yes, please, uh, uh, <laughs> this means that please behave and we, we look forward to constructive criticism above every, anything else. So without further any further ado, I would like to introduce the first uh, paper uh, today. And this will be uh, by uh, Michael Fermanovsky, who teaches classes in uh, Japanese pop culture at Ryukoku University in Kyoto. And his research focuses on the intersection of popular music, fashion, and dance in the pre- and post-war years, with an emphasis uh, on the 1950s and early 1960s. Uh, Michael's most recent publication looked at the early careers of jazz vocalists Eri Tsiemi and Yukimura Izumi as part of a larger study of the impact of the U.S. occupation on Japan's entertainment industry. Now, Michael's current research examines the impact of popular culture, especially movie actresses, models, and teen magazines on the development of Western fashion for women in the 1950s. Uh, so please, Michael, uh, I invite you to yeah. uh, share screen. Uh, yes, I will do that in a moment. Begin your presentation. Okay, let's just see if this works. Okay. Um, how are we doing here then? Can we see it? Perfect. Excellent. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm somebody who basically teaches with images. I, I don't write papers. I write articles, but I, I don't deliver papers. So what you're going to see today is basically pictures. So, you know, a picture tells a thousand stories. I'll be commenting on the pictures that I've assembled, but Basically, you look at them and make up your own mind. So I'm going to be talking about Johnny Kitagawa, uh, who you might know is the person that created the Johnny's organization, Johnny's Gym Show. Uh, and uh, I've been working on him for about eight years. Um, but what I'm doing today is I'm going to try to connect it to the other presentations. So let me begin by, uh, let's see if I can get rid of this. This is a list of the kinds of the articles that I've written in the last uh, uh, 10 years or so. And you can see that I focused on jazz, country music, rockabilly, pop, and quite recently on folk music uh, and also group sounds. So all of my articles are available at ResearchGate and Academia uh, with free access. So please take a look at that. Um, just trying to see how I can get rid of this. I can't. Okay. So um, here's a picture of a very rare picture of Johnny Kitagawa. And he has the Guinness Book of World Records for producing the most number one singles, the most number of concerts, 
And of course, he's known for the whole uh, Johnny's organization, which includes all the groups you can see on this slide, uh, SMAP, Arashi, and so on. And on the left side picture, you see his uh, Guinness Book of World Records uh, with one of the only pictures of him that exist. And if you look at the second picture, you'll see he's not there. It's all of his uh, Johnny's uh, uh, acts, um, but he's not actually there. So they're receiving it for him. And by the way, he, as you'll see in a moment, he died recently. So here's pictures from his funeral from 2019. Um, Trying to get rid of this, I can't. Um, so over here, newspaper articles, over here in a big stadium, uh, his funeral, and here gathered together all of the members of all the most famous groups, although there were some notable absences, and that may be related to some of the controversies around his background. Okay. Here is a list of the articles in English on Johnny's. The top two are focusing on idols, female fans, and so on. And the bottom two, which includes me and my friend uh, Jason Makoto Chan, looking at transnational flows and looking at pop culture history, and in my case, looking at music history. And then at the bottom, an excellent journalist who's based in uh, Tokyo, who wrote as early as 2012 on the Jim Shore system. So, what about in Japanese? Well, in Japanese, obviously, there are a number of books, and I have four of them here. Uh, the one on the left is probably the best one of the most sort of semi-academic one, but most of them are just dealing with gossip, scandal, and fan issues. And the other thing is, of course, they mostly deal with uh, the recent period, whereas I'm focusing mostly on his early years. Okay. Okay, so here are a whole bunch of questions that I have been asking myself over the last eight or nine years. So I'm going to be giving you the whole Johnny Kitagawa story. So part of that story is him growing up in Los Angeles in, in uh, little Tokyo and being sort of immersed in the musical and theater culture there. Another issue, of course, with him is his gay identity. Uh, he didn't come out, but it was, this was an open secret that he was gay, and he was involved in a number of potential scandals of predatory uh, behavior with the teenage boys under his charge. Um, also, I'm going to be trying to connect with the other people in the panel by looking at the early 70s. We'll come to that soon. So what happened in the early 70s? How did he deal with a situation that was not really suited to the kind of... Uh, uh, music and template that he had created. And then what happened as a result of his uh, failure in the 70s and how that, how did that lead to the success in the 80s and the formation of the boy band template? And finally, what was his overall artistic vision? Um, he's famous for his connection with uh, West Side Story and the idea of bringing the American musical tradition to Japan. So those are some of the questions I've been asking myself over the years, and I don't necessarily have the answers. But now I'm just going to go into what I do best, which is straight ahead chronology. OK, so I won't read my chronology, but you can just take a look at it. And by the way, I've color coded things. So if your eyes go to the blue, you'll get the main uh, things. So uh, growing up in little Tokyo to a father who was sent by the uh, Shingon Koyasan uh, sect to administer to the Japanese Americans in Little Tokyo. Then during World War II, when he's uh, just um, 11 years old, he's repatriated to Japan with his sister Mary, lives in Wakayama, survives a bomb attack. There seems to be some evidence that he worked at the Ernie Pyle Theater, which you may not have heard of. That was the name given to the Takarazuka building when the GHQ took it over in 1945. Then he returns to the United States, goes to LA College, what is now UCLA. And in his uh, mid-teens, he's lucky enough to meet uh, Hibari Misora uh, on her West Coast tour. He also met Tanaka Kinio and uh, Koga Masao. And he's interpreting for them when they come and do their, when Hibari comes and does his, her show uh, in the uh, temple there in Little Tokyo. 
Then at the age of around 20, he gets a job uh, as an interpreter in the Criminal Investigation Command CID in Japan. It's during the Korean War, so that's how he's able to go. And he's living in Washington Heights um, and he's working with displaced orphans in Korea on and off and coming back to Japan. Of course, Washington Heights, that is now, you know, the Yoyogi uh, Park area. That was a completely American uh, city or mini city. He also attends uh, Sofia University, Georgi, and works as a stage manager. Then comes the big event where he meets a bunch of boys who are playing baseball in the park, in Yoyogi Park. He puts together a little baseball team, coaches them, takes them to his sister's bar, and maybe gay predatory behavior takes place at this time. We don't know. This is the rumors. Then the big event, it's a big event in Japanese cultural history when he takes these teenage boys to see West Side Story, and they're all blown away by the dancing that they see and come up with the idea of forming a little group by themselves, which they do, and use the name the Johnnies. He then connects up with a Nabe Pro, Watanabe Pro, that's the biggest talent agency in Japan at the time. Uh, and then he tries to launch the career of this group, the Johnnies. They, you know, they're like 16, 17 years old, and they do have a few hits, but it's not a huge success. And at this point, it's not clear what he wanted to do with them. Um, maybe he was thinking more in terms of musicals than in pop music. Let's continue the story. So he's got modest success with this group, and then he decides that he, they need to improve their skills. He takes them to Los Angeles on his own purse, um, and they stay in Los Angeles for a month taking dance lessons. They do some recordings. Probably during this time, uh, Kitagawa would have, well, he would have watched on TV, uh, seen Shindig and Hullabaloo. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember those. Those were pop programs on the TV. Also, the monkeys emerge at almost exactly the time that he arrives with his group in Los Angeles. And so he not only sees the monkeys, but he sees the management behind the monkeys and how they operated. And that's going to be one of the things that um, gives him ideas for the future. Then when he comes back to Japan in August 1966, he's probably in shock because the group sounds boom has taken over. And this is sort of the opposite of what he's all about, because these are boys playing guitars on stage and doing a sort of a semi rock uh, approach. And so he disbands the Johnnies and he creates a new group called the Four Leaves. Um, but it's very difficult for him to attain much success with the Four Leaves. They do have a number of hits, but you know, with the group sounds dominating and then later, of course, uh, the early 70s rock and singer songwriter scene, it's gonna be very difficult for him. Now let's get to some visuals. On the left, you see scenes from Hullabaloo. This is the first TV, music TV program in America, which had dancing, male dancers as well as female dancers. I've got no evidence, no proof that he took ideas for them. The same thing applies to the Motown dancing groups. I have no direct evidence that he was borrowing from them. And in fact, the way that they danced was uh, not really like musical acts, but it's almost certain that he would have seen them, that he would have been exposed to them. So I did some research on the choreographer of the, uh, this is the Four Tops and this is the Miracle, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. And so their choreographer was a, a guy called Cholly Atkins. Okay, now let's take a look at those two groups that I mentioned, the Johnnies. And if you look at the picture on the left side, it looks very much like uh, West Side Story. And then you see some of the covers of their albums. And then the Four Leaves, the second group that he created. Now I've watched videos. There are a couple of videos on YouTube of the Johnnies dancing, and it's you know it's kind of looks pretty weak compared with the way the way kids dance today. But nevertheless, they were starting to use a few moves from West Side Story, and um, he really was ahead of his time because there is no there are no boy bands dancing on stage in the United States or or the UK at this time. So he really is ahead of his time. Okay, let's go on. Okay, so I, this is a, in this slide, I'm trying to identify and define 
the influences and the limitations of his approach to uh, the situation that he found himself in the early 70s. So I'm trying to put together here all of his influences. There's the influences that he got from growing up in the melting pot that was uh, post-war Los Angeles. Um, there's the West Side Story influence. I've put in the red font things which limited him. So he, like most Japanese or Japanese American, had a limited understanding of the Afri African American musical tradition. Um, Another thing is he's very close to the Nabe Pro organization. I've written a number of articles about Nabe Pro, um, if anyone's interested. Um, very hierarchical management system. He's also aware of probably of Phil Spector, um, who had his own kind of pop machine, and the creators of the Monkeys and the Monkeys TV show, which of course was a worldwide success in 1966 and 67. So in when the group sounds thing starts, he's really at a bit of a loss and he's at even more of a loss when we get to the early 70s and the whole, you know, adult pop singer songwriter and rock music scene. Um, one of the things he's also got to think about is does he want to stick with a boy band or have himself a solo artist? And as we're going to see, he comes up with the idea of uh, Go Hiromi as the person who will solve all of his problems, and that turns out not to be uh, successful. One more thing he has to deal with in the early 70s is a rival, the Hori Pro organization, which created the Star Tanjo uh, TV program, a little bit like American Idol, but trying to um, find and recruit uh, female mid teen uh, idols. Okay, so I spent quite a lot of time on this slide try, for people who maybe don't know that much about this situation to kind of delineate the situation in early 70s Japan, the extreme polarization that existed. And this, this same polarization existed in the UK and the US. So you've got maybe the biggest single um, commercial area, which is the mainstream Kaiokyoku and Enka. Uh, one of the people that we'll see who represented this is Itsuki Hiroshi. Then you've got the new pop that's with the demise of the group sounds. We've got this new kind of pop music, which is epitomized by Sawada Kenji, the lead singer of the Tigers, and Kamayatsu Hiroshi from the Spiders group sounds, and the early rock group Carol. Then you've got the Star Tanjo, which I mentioned before, which is grooming these female idols of which Yamaguchi Momoe is the biggest. And by the way, the green font is my estimation of how many people in a particular demographic were interested or listening to this music or took an interest in it. So we're talking about 20 or 30 percent of young people for these first three. Then we get into the folk rock and the new music and the singer songwriter that that uh, Scott and uh, Laurie are going to be talking about a bit more. And I would estimate that around 10%. So Matsutoya, uh, Yosui, uh, Yoshida Takuro, and Izumi Yashigeru. Then there's the Kansai and the political folk that's epitomized by the folk crusaders and Takada Wataru, probably mostly just elite university students. I've come up with a figure of three to five percent. That would mean three to five percent of that demographic, you know, of the 20s demographic. And then the hippie rock represented by Happy End. And then a quite significant number of people who basically said, I'm not listening to any Japanese music of any kind. I'm just interested in British rock or American rock, but particularly British rock, Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple. Uh, these would have been more male than female. And then continuing, and it never ends, is the jazz scene, which is mostly male, mostly over 30, and I would estimate that around two to three percent. So that's my effort to delineate what we what we, the others are going to be talking about. So to go through them one by one, here is the Kaiokyoku, uh, what would later be called Enka. And the reason I've come up with these pictures is to show you that our image of Enka as being sort of you know old-fashioned and and representing old people. That's not the case in 1972. Look at Mori Shinshi, who was part of Watanabe Pro. Look how 
hip he is in his leather jacket, all right? So, by the way, starting from now, every single picture you're gonna see on the screen is a picture from either 1971, 72, 73, or 74. So I took quite a lot of time in making sure that I stick chronologically with this uh, range of years. Now let's look at the pop rock, sort of semi hippie rock. On the left, you've got Sawada Kenji, who basically was the biggest singer in Japan in the early 70s, uh, coming out of the Tigers organization, part of the Nabe Pro uh, group. Here you've got Hisama, uh, you've got uh, um, Kamayatsu, and this is Koshino Junko, and this is uh, Yasui uh, Kasumi, who I have written an article about, and it's a, you can see that at ResearchGate. This is the group Carol. Here's Sawada Kenji again, and here's uh, Yazawa uh, Eikichi from Carol. And again, look at the dates that they were born, Sawada Kenji 1948, Yazawa 1949, the only Kamayatsu is a lot older. Now let's go to our idol machine. And so the Star Tanjo, Star Tanjo, which was on TV uh, in the early 70s and produced the Hana no Tusen uh, trio, of which Yamaguchi Momo is the most famous. And again, they're all born in 1958 or 59. So they're just 15 years old at this time. Okay. So, you know, just contrast that with what I just showed you there and there and there. And now let's go to the, the real hippies. And there's the dates that they were born, 1946, 48, 48. Okay. So it took me a long time to find these pictures. There's lots of pictures of these people in later years, but these are all from 1972 or 73, the very, very early stage of their career as singer-songwriters, um, taking cues to some extent from American singer-songwriters. Uh, Michael, I'm very sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. uh, could you, well, you, you can have a few more minutes, but I think yeah. we need to wrap it up soon. Yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go a lot faster now. So this is uh, a happy end. And here's our British rock groups in Japan. Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, and Deep Purple. Um, they all came in more or less the same 12 month period, a huge fan base. Now on the left hand side here, you've got the Osmonds and, and uh, David Cassidy, the idols in America. And on the right hand side in the very same years, you've got the six most popular rock albums in America. That shows you the, the, the generational divide between the teenagers and the early twenties uh, college educated people. Over here, you've got a list of Kitagawa's main strategy for penetrating the business uh, and the cultural divide. He's going to borrow from that Sawada Kenji, David Cassidy, Jackson 5, Osmond's Partridge family template and see if he can put together something new. And I can show that to you visually. So take a look at this slide on the left, the monkeys from America, the tigers, group sound Sawada Kenji, post group sounds, the Partridge family on TV in America, the Finger fi Five from Okinawa, an Okinawa version of the Osmonds. Put them all together and you've got the Four Leaves and the Johnny's template. Um, I'll just leave this up there for you to look at. So the androgynous and feminine elements, he borrows that from Sawada Kenji. Uh, he's got that, the, you know, the uh, older, middle, younger brother family trope. Um, inside his groups. Uh, now I'm going to jump quickly to uh, Gohiromi. I'll just leave this up for 20 seconds so you can take a quick look at it. Gohiromi is the person that he's hoping will break him. Uh, it's his prince and uh, the rumor is that he fell in love with Gohiromi. By the way, Gohiromi is still around, he's uh, 66. Here's some pictures of Gohiromi as a uh, in 1972. And maybe this is my most interesting slide and took about 10 hours to get these pictures together. And I think it speaks for itself. Donnie Osmond at the top, Gohi Romi at the bottom in 1972 to 73. Okay, very clear. Um, 
what happened was that Go Hiromi became uh, a major star and then left. And that put uh, Kitagawa Johnny into a bit of a depression. And he had to decide, what am I going to do now? And it seems that as a result, he started to focus more on the boy bands. And here's my concluding remarks. So I'll just leave that up for 30 seconds. So you can read them. I'm not going to read them out. And I think that sets the scene for the next. Oh, thank you very much. And I'll be happy to share that PowerPoint with anybody who wants it. Uh, thank you <laughs> indeed, Michael, for, uh, among other things, providing us a map to navigate uh, in our uh, subsequent uh, presentations. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I'm up next. So uh, I won't be doing much of an uh, introduction. Uh, I'm Laura Gitznik. I uh, teach at Hiroshima University. Uh, Recently, uh, I've done a few classes on po Japanese popular music as well. So, uh, but on the other hand, this is uh, something rather new to me. Uh, most of my work so far has been on Japanese cinema, but uh, the, the more I watched Japanese films, especially from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, I realized that one can't really uh, confidently uh, uh, talk about cinema without knowing a lot about what was going on in the in the world of Japanese popular music at the time? These things are deeply intertwined. Uh, now, for my presentation, uh, I hope you will be able to. So, where is it? Yes. Can you see the screen that I'm sharing? Could just anyone? Uh, yes, perfect. Okay, okay, very good then. So, uh, this paper is about a place, a building to be precise, with its uh, imposingly tall roof reminiscent of a temple hall. Uh, there are also three stars on it, of which a bit later. Uh, this structure stands somewhere, somewhat hidden on the edge of the main campus of Kyoto University. It is called Kyodai Seibu Kodo or uh, Seibu Kodo for short by those who are, uh, for those who are in the know. And for those who are, it is nothing less than a symbol of Kyoto's vibrant art and music scene of the 1970s and beyond. Uh, even to this day, the structure has undergone very little change, both in its appearance and operating model. And these are some of the pictures uh, I took in September 2019 when attending a concert there. And this was the time when we still had concerts. Uh, and here are some of uh, more art, some more artful photos of the interior from 1990. My aim today is to chart a history of this venue, focusing on its heyday in the 1970s. I will do this by providing a timeline, pointing out relevant facts and famous or even infamous incidents involving uh, Seibu Kodo. And by doing so, I aim to delineate its significance as a focal point of Kyoto's popular culture, but also how it both succeeded and failed to have a national and even global presence. Uh, different arts, most notably rock music, took center stage in Seibu Kodo. But as we shall see, these were backed by a peculiar community-based management model and its links to radical politics in the era that followed closely the undoing of youth political movements of the 1960s. Now, much has been said over the years about popular music's relationship with political movements, and I believe that Seibu Kodo can add to this discussion by providing an example of how art and politics meet in a very real way, as the excess energy from social dissent was being productively channeled to cultural activities with both its benefits and shortcomings. What comes to the issues or other problems when dealing with Seibu Kodo, there indeed exists plenty of anecdotal evidence and urban legends surrounding it. However, the fact that most of it is markedly apocryphal poses a problem about finding reliable sources that could serve as solid historical evidence. As a result, everything that I say here today uh, should be taken uh, with a pinch of salt. 
And there is certainly a need to triangulate uh, between various scattered and unreliable evidence, which ultimately also requires an anthropological approach to substantiate any such findings. Uh, I should note that some people have tried before to put together uh, similar accounts of Cebu Kodo, but there seem, they seem to have failed, partly because they lacked access to the very core of the rather secretive organization that runs it. Uh, on a personal note, this place first came to my full attention about four years ago uh, during random conversations with local people such as used book dealers. And I was hoping uh, by uh, uh, proposing this paper to the EAJS conference that was supposed to take place first a year ago uh, that I will uh, that this will prompt me to do more anthropological research uh, leading up to the presentation. But of course, this was not to be uh, for the obvious reason of uh, the pandemic still going on. Uh, what comes to the sources that I have been able to identify and work through, uh, well, there is nothing entirely solid here, which makes this task really challenging. We have everything from popular magazines, bulletins, random essays, and so on. And there is already another archival layer uh, emerging in the form of social media, which, of course, makes voices and their authority especially difficult to assess. Uh, as a prehistory of Cebu Kodo, as a musical venue, it appears to have been erected to commemorate the birth of Crown Prince Akihito, the previous emperor in 1937, then relocated to its current place in 1963. It was first mainly used by various university so-called circles. Uh, there were dance performances and a film club, one of which involved the, few, the, the director Oshima Nagista. Uh, and this was also around the time when it became to be student-run, a kind of autonomous entity on the Kyoto University campus. And toward the end of the 1960s, during the student riots, uh, Seibu Koda was the venue for musical events such as Balisai and Handaigaku. But it was not until 1971 and the concert series Mojo West that it truly emerged as a center for Kyoto's alternative arts and music scene. In March 1971, a big rock concert was held at Stebu Kodo. And, and this is what first brought uh, prominence, apparently, allegedly, prominence to bands such as Pig, which was a supergroup uh, uh, comprising uh, former members of, of group sound acts, such as the Tempters, the Spiders, the Tigers, of which uh, Michael already mentioned the, the lead singer was, was the same Sawada Kenji. Uh, and notably, Mura Hachibu, uh, that you can see on this uh, photo taken in front of uh, Seibu Kodo. And Mojo West, the concert series, was the brainchild of a local artist turned promoter, Kimura Hideki, who later became a prolific writer, which makes him one of the invaluable sources for studying the history of Seibu Kodo. This event was covered in length in the leading youth male oriented magazine, Heibon Punch, uh, with the title uh, Kyodai Seibu Kodo de Roku ga Bakuhatsushita rock exploded in Cebu Kodo. Now, this was uh, the first time when the venue entered public consciousness on the national level. And this success resulted in further concerts under the same banner that were held fortnightly on Saturdays. Uh, every Japanese uh, band worth its salt uh, ended up performing there. There was Uchida Yuya, Flower Traveling Band, Miki Curtis and Samurai, uh, Kamayatsu Hiroshi, Mops, Zuno Keisatsu, Carmen Maki and, and so on. So the, the capacity of the, uh, of the building was only 600, uh, but apparently it always exceeded this figure to accommodate uh, approximately 800 predominantly young people. And there are reports that uh, hippies hitchhiked down from Tokyo to attend these concerts. And famous live recordings were uh, soon made there. Uh, this is probably the most famous one, most, perhaps the most legendary live album of them all in Japan. And it also shows the altered appearance of uh, Seibu Kodo on its back cover. And, and this will provide a segue to finally talk about the three stars on its roof. Now, in summer 1972, a local Kyoto artist by the name of Gori, and his real name was Mori Shimako, was approached to do something artistic to the roof of Seibu Kodo that was currently in a bad shape. The Gori himself 
himself, he'd have, he had been living in Spain, so he came up with the idea of painting the roof blue to make it resemble Andalusian sky that he had come to miss. Uh, there are various accounts about you know, who went to buy paint and uh, what quantity was needed, how many people uh, were required to finish this painting job in one day. But most importantly, in the middle of the task, uh, the artist was asked by one Takase Taiji, or Taichan, whom we will find out more in a moment, uh, to add three stars, three red stars to the design. And the artist Gori, he hesitated first, but then painted them with free hand, I think. You can, you can see from here that indeed it looks a bit improvised and maybe uh, from a design point of view, not that well executed. But why did the artist hesitate? Because there was an implicit political meaning uh, to this. Only a few months before there had been an incident at Tel Aviv airport uh, at that time uh, uh, named Lod airport, where a number of people were killed by members of the Japanese Red Army. Uh, left wing, one of the left wing terrorist groups. Uh, there were three of them, two perished on the spot and the surviving one was uh, sub uh, subsequently tried and imprisoned. Uh, so the three stars uh, on the roof of Cebu Kodo were to symbolize the souls of these so-called martyrs to the cause. And believe it or not, the stars are still there, although they have uh, turned from uh, red to yellow since. The Lord Airport Massacre, as it is also called, had followed shortly uh, another one, the notorious standoff at Asama Sanso that alienated the Japanese public from the leftist cause and all but spelled uh, end to this radical movement in the country. Now, notably, uh, these events within the larger picture of social dissent were preceded in 1968 and 1969 by the so-called Zenkyoto, the student protests at various universities, university campuses across Japan, and, and Kyoto University was not an exception. But it was not only barricades, but also cultural activities that were taking place within the campuses that were being occupied by the students and were to form a template for Seibu Kodo and its operating model. And many of the people involved in the protest were also later pretty crucial for Seibu Kodo. Uh, so the sheer number of seminal musical acts that took stage there is enough to elevate it to an important status in the history of post-war Japanese popular culture, but more than uh, was happening uh, on stage, I'm curious about was, what was going on behind it, how these events were devised, organized, and by whom, and which impulses informed these activities in the first place. Uh, this brings us to a small number of people, effectively counterculture heroes, uh, whose overall contribution has not been uh, all that well documented, although it is very much part of Kyoto's urban lore. And what connects these individuals is that something uh, like Yonaoshi or the bettering the world was definitely part of their agenda, if not uh, the guiding principle. And what also strikes me here is the common use of nicknames when, when talking about these persons, which reveals an aspect of uh, close-knit community. Now, first we have uh, Takase Taizi or Taichang. He was allegedly uh, the, the de facto leader of, uh, Zeng, had been a de facto leader of the uh, barricades at uh, Zen Kyoto at Kyoto University, and later the owner of bar Shirakaba near Ginkakuji, which was the epicenter of many ideas, including that of Seibu Kodo. Uh, he was a restless soul and died in his mid 40s, such as did uh, the next person, Komatsu Tatsu or Komatsang, who was the main promoter of avant-garde theater in Kyoto at the time. So he's, he's a really well-known uh, figure in, in, in certain circles. And then there is Kiyan, uh, uh, Kimura Hideki, who's already mentioned as the producer of uh, Mojo West. Uh, and he's still alive and active as a painter. Uh, and then there is Aochan, who was the leader of Seirenkyo, uh, the Council of Seibu Kodo, of which a bit later. And last but not least, there was Maki, whose real identity I have not been able to confirm. It was a former Yakuza, who was a powerful financial supporter of Seibu Kodo's rock events. And it is said that in 1976, he invested 10 million yen worth of personal funds to bring none other than Frank Zappa uh, to Kyoto. Next, I would briefly like to talk about two concerts that proved crucial for Seibu Kodo. Among rare indistributable facts in this otherwise apocryphal mass of evidence is that on February the 4th in 1976, Frank Zappa and his backing band Mothers of Invention held a concert at Seibu Kodo. 
Uh, Frank Zappa allegedly called it the most beautiful and crazy performing space he had ever been to. However, Zappa was actually not that well known in Japan at the time. He was not the, the whole big in Japan thing uh, for foreign musical acts was, uh, was to emerge a bit later. Uh, so in order to ensure that all tickets to the concert got sold, a promotional campaign had to be devised. And this included a huge balloon bearing the name Zappa hoisted at Kamogawa uh, waterfront, but also notably lighting bonfires on Daimonjiyama, uh, replicating in effect the annual Gozan no Okuribi during the Obon festival. Although of course, in this case, it was not, it was February, not August. And instead of the big sign, uh, there was a huge Z for Zappa. Uh, there are a few hazy photos surviving from this uh, event, but uh, from what, what you can see here is actually Kiyan's, uh, Kimura Hideki's rendering of it. At any rate, uh, Zappa's concert proved to be a watershed event for Seibu Koda, and it was when soon followed by a number of other major artists coming to Kyoto in the late 1970s, such as Tom Waits, Talking Heads, XTC, The Stranglers, and The Police. Uh, thus, we can see how in the course of a decade, Seibu Koda went from being a local venue to that of national importance and finally global. Sadly, this was not to last. While Zappa was the beginning of international statue for Seibu Koda, another concert symbolized the abrupt end of it. Uh, in, uh, uh, on uh, the 20th of February 1980, a concert by the police had to be stopped at one point as people were beginning to storm the stage throwing water on the singer's sting and performing other kinds of mischief. As a result, the real police had to come to the stage to help the foreign stage crew to restrain the culprits. So what exactly were those people protesting against? Most of the accounts point out that it was the role of the promoter Udo, Udo Ongaku Jimusho that caused this breakdown. Now, unthinkable in the context of previous events at Seibu Kodo, uh, the promoter, they had fenced off the premises, they performed camera checks for the audience, prohibited bringing in alcohol and deployed a large number of security guards. Now, all this went against, went against the grain of what Seibu Kodo was considered to be. It was markedly different from other spaces that could be rented for such musical performances. So what had apparently happened is that unwritten, certain unwritten rules and procedures were being breached and violated. And finally, this is where we come to Seibu Kodo Renkaku Kyogikai, or uh, Seirenkyo in short, which could be rendered as contact or communication council of Seibu Kodo. It was founded in 1975 upon an understanding that what is required in order to sustain a certain type of alternative culture uh, is a place of expression secured by self-operating and self-management. All events had to be approved by the regular meetings of the council. And this is what the organizers of the police concert had failed to do, instead setting up a temporary committee and making a hasty decision. Now the council had asked the promoter to call off the event altogether, but this request was ignored. And then some of the more active members of the community decided to protest by interrupting the concert. Now, after this incident, all details of it were made public in the council's bulletin, Kompo. And those members with close ties to the promoter were left or were forced to leave the council. And allegedly, this, resorted, uh, this resulted in making that position, uh, the status of, of the Seirenkyo even stronger. At any rate, this is their version, the council version of the story. In reality, not having displayed enough professionalism as a venue, big artists, big foreign artists subsequently avoided Seibu Kodo. So if the guerrilla style management delivered positive results in Frank Zappa's case, it provided to be less so with the police. Uh, the police incident also reveals the complexity of politics inherently embedded in student movement and the dilemma of freedom between individual expression and group-driven bureaucracy. Now, a paradox that arises from a rigid community-based operational model is that such groups that preach liberties and individuality seem to operate on principles not altogether dissimilar from those they appear to be criticizing. Now, this kind of guerrilla, but nonetheless extremely collective thinking is also present in uh, another place, Yoshidario, the legendary student dormitory that is literally a stone, away, so stone throw away from Seibu Kodo, just on the other, other opposite side of Higashioji street. 
and it has been recently in the news uh, due to its continued legal battle against the management of Kyoto University that has for decades attempted to tear it down and replace it with a more uh, stable and sanitized structure. But inadvertently or not, the fallout of the police concert could have been precisely what Serenkyo had wanted, to cut Se Sebu Koda off from global flows and return it to being a local venue and to its roots in radical student movement. So as you can see also from this poster of an end of the year event just after the police incident in 1980, illustrated by none other than manga artist and anime director Otomo Katsuhiro of Akira fame, this militant sentiment was still very much present, even if only superficially. But this is already a different story about Seibu Kyodo uh, in the 1980s and beyond. But uh, this is uh, uh, talk for uh, a different time and beyond the limits of our panel today. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, we are going a bit over time, but hopefully we'll be able to uh, catch up or at least maintain this pace. Uh, and next, I would like to um, introduce our next presenter, who is uh, Scott Olgard. I hope this is the uh, right pronunciation of your name. You've got it, Laurie. Okay, because I think in, I don't know if it's Danish or something Norwegian. that it should be like, all God, I think, is, you know, <laughs> the original, but I'm, I'm not even going to, you know. So Scott teaches East Asian studies at Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. Uh, the sun, sun has just risen there, <laughs> as you can see from his background. So and he's, uh, he has a book out soon, very soon. And it's titled Homesick Blues, uh, Musical Storytelling in Modern Japan. And the book explores some of the ways that social actors have been used mus have used music to navigate thorny questions of everyday life in Japan since 1970s or so, so against the backdrop of shifting cultural, geopolitical, and economic contexts. And uh, Kagawa Ryo, whom uh, Scott will be talking about today, is, is one of the book's central figures. So take it away, Scott. Well, thanks very much, Lori. Um, I'm going to try to get my uh, screen share set up here, make sure I'm sharing sound. Uh, and I am, uh, hold on a sec, is that gonna work? Yes, I think so. Uh, okay, can people uh, see my first slide here? Yes? Yes. Okay. Yes, okay, great, perfect, thank you, wonderful. Um, okay, in the interest of time, uh, folks, uh, I'll just say uh, a quick thank you for uh, allowing me to, uh, to to be here this morning, this afternoon, this evening, uh, wherever you happen to be, uh, and, and dive right in. Um, in August of 1970, uh, an unknown staffer at a subsidiary of the well-known uh, music label and distributor URC uh, was pulled on stage for an unscheduled performance at Japan's second Nakatsugawa Folk Jamboree. Uh, now, the staffer's name was Kosai Yoshihiro, uh, and he'd been working at the subsidiary for about a year uh, as a gopher for URC artist Takada Wataru and as a promoter creating radio ads for the label's latest albums. Now, Kosai was no stranger to musical practice. He'd been a vocalist in Beatles cover bands uh, as, a vo as a student at Kyoto Sangyo University, for example, uh, and he fancied himself first and foremost a rock aficionado. Uh, surrounded as he was by the greats of the Kansai folk movement of around 1970, uh, though, it's not surprising that he began experimenting with songwriting in that genre uh, as well. He learned eagerly from Takada, who you can see uh, in this rather grainy uh, photo on the far uh, left. Uh, and Takada, by this point in 1970, was already generally understood uh, as the godfather of Kansai folk, uh, despite being relatively young. Uh, and from banjo player Iwai Hiroshi, who's on the, on, on the right, um, the three would often get together and jam outside of work, uh, particularly as, as Takada uh, and Iwai uh, were preparing for uh, their second Nakatsugawa uh, engagement in 1970. Uh, and in fact, uh, it was these two established artists who dragged Kosai uh, on stage as part of their set at Nakatsugawa to play a tune that he'd been working on. Uh, and the tune uh, was called Kyokun Ichi, uh, or Lesson One. Uh, now, I'll leave the lyrics up. I want to play just a little bit of this for you so you can get a sense of it. <laughs>
ついふらふらと国のためなのと言われるとね青くなって尻りをみなさい逃げなさい隠れなさい奥にはオーケー again I'll bring the、uh, volume down but leave the lyrics up just, just for a moment、um, the song was just an instant hit Uh, in this moment, Kosai Yoshihiro vanishes、uh, and is replaced by a reluctant folk singer、uh, by the name of Kagawa Deo. Now, Kagawa would go on to build a career that spanned 46 years and saw him release、uh, 16 albums in a really remarkable diversity of musical styles from folk to country to rock.、Uh, he'd collaborate with the late playwright Higashi Yutaka、uh, in a 1975 production of、uh, The October Country. Uh, he made occasional television appearances. He moved beyond Japan to play concerts in China、uh, and much later North America、uh, as well. And although he's never been a million selling artist,、uh, Kagawa became an inspirational figure and teacher in his own right、uh, to some of、uh, the biggest selling figures of Japan's new music and singer songwriter era,、uh, including folk rockers like Nagabu Tsitsyoshi,、uh, Yoshida Takuro,、uh, and Matsuyama Chiharu. Uh, and especially since his untimely death in 2017, Kagawa has entered Japanese public memory as one of the most influential figures on the critically oriented Kansai folk scene、uh, of around 1970.、Uh, his importance to folk and to modern Japanese popular music writ large、uh, simply cannot be overstated. Now, as others have pointed out, what was called folk in Japan, and especially Kansai folk, which emerges out of the area around Kyoto and Osaka,、uh, has been broadly understood as the musical manifestation of oppositional protest. Uh, in Japan in the late 60s and early 70s, or at least its most, most faithful soundtrack. Now, much of the music from that moment does indeed fit that narrative. In the summer of 1969, for example, folk star Okabayashi Nobuyasu, who you can see on the left,、uh, went on the attack against school teachers,、uh, the corporate elite,、uh, politicians, clergy members, writers,、uh, even the emperor himself,、uh, with his highly topical targeted song called Ksokurai Bushi,、uh, or the Eat Shit Ballad. Uh, in October of the same year,、uh, Takaishi Tomoya, who you can see on the right,、uh, released a Japanese translation of Ewan McCall's anti Vietnam War song,、uh, The Ballad of Ho Chi Minh. And at around the same moment, Okabayashi and Takaishi were working together, collaborating on the well known anthem Tomoyo, or O Friend, a work that really typified Japan's protest folk movement,、uh, with his exhortations to, and I'm quoting from the lyrics here, to stoke the flames of battle, for the dawn is nigh, and on the other side of this darkness, a shimmering tomorrow awaits. Now, all of this musing, musicking was occurring within the historical context of escalating conflict in Southeast Asia, the ongoing student movement,、uh, and so on. In a sense, Kagawa's debut work does seem to fit nicely、uh, within this protest tradition.、Uh, at least that's mostly how it's been remembered.、Uh, the North American distributor of the Kyokun LP,、uh, for example, where the song appears in LP form, goes so far as to proclaim uh, that uh, Kyokun Ichi、uh, is a quote, life affirming anti war ballad. Uh, now, there's just one problem with all of this. Kagawa himself loudly proclaimed throughout his career that he hated folk. In 1973, he even released a work dryly titled Folk Singer,、uh, in which he vowed to travel the length and breadth of Japan to track down and kill a man who'd had the gall to call him a folk singer. Now, as the chuckling that's audible throughout this live recording helps to establish, Kagawa's murderous fury in Folk Singer is in jest. But at the same time, it isn't. In important ways, he was serious. I don't want to be painted with the same brush as those guys.、Uh, he told me in conversation in Tokyo in 2015. And there he was referencing key gatekeepers of Japan's critical folk tradition, folks like、uh, Okabayashi Nobuyasu and Takaishi Tomoya, without doing so by name. He went on to cite and dismiss、uh, some very specific turns of phrase that are associated with Japan's new left and student movements of around 1970 and that surfaced nearly verbatim in folk songs like Tomoyo. Uh, and the ballad of Ho Chi Minh, Teo Tori Ate, Let Us Join Hands, Yuaki Wa Chikai, The Dawn Is Nai, Sen So Han Tai, No War, and so on. Like his teacher, Takada Wataru, Kagawa was really skeptical of something called oppositional protest and alarmed by the ways in which folk songs tended to be reduced to musical stand ins for what he understood to be limited and not altogether helpful conceptualizations of politics. I never did like those raise your fist and yell things. He said in a newspaper interview in 2007. But we have to be careful here because this doesn't make him apolitical. Kagawa, in short, seems to have wanted to put a distance between folk as it was, gen as it was generally understood、uh, in 1970 or so, and folk as he wanted to practice it、uh, in the early 1970s and beyond.
Now this involved musical ethics that I call anti-folk, which is not a simple negation of folk, but rather a negation of the negations that folk tends to enunciate and the articulation of something quite different. For Kagawa, this had to do with interrogating and scrambling some of the sense-making mechanisms of everyday life. And as I'll discuss momentarily, this ethics is really exemplified in his debut work, Kyokunichi. Now, Kagawa's eagerness to forge different paths was likely inspired, at least in part, by history. By the time he was dragged onto the Nakatsugawa stage, for instance, the ink was dry on the 1970 renewal of the Ampo Treaty. Uh, this renewal didn't generate the massive 1960-style protests that had been hoped for, and this was a fizzling that both revealed and reinforced the gradual waning of organized street-level protest action in this moment. In the background of Kagawa's ongoing development as an artist, Okinawa's status was shifting uh, as well. Although his actual handover would not occur until 1972, Okinawa's so-called reversion to Japanese rule was agreed to in 1971, uh, and this removed another hot-button protest issue from public discourse. As Laura mentioned a moment ago, the student movement was also waning, as was public patience for so-called radical protest uh, in the context of a perceived swing toward increased violence on the part of protesters. And, and any remaining goodwill would more or less implode uh, entirely with the deadly hostage crisis and purge at the Asamasanso Mountain Lodge in Nagano Prefecture in February of 19, 1972. And by 1973, when the song Folk Singer, which I just mentioned, uh, was released, the American war in Vietnam was winding down as well. Now, these shifting historical contexts presented challenges to critical musical storytellers like Yo Kagawa. While folk's critical interventions were undoubtedly powerful, the music's efficacy as political critique was also necessarily fleeting. The protest-oriented musical interventions mounted by Takaishi, Okabayashi, and others around this moment relied on isolated historical contingencies in order to be legible. And one way we can think about this is to ask, well, what happens, for example, to the efficacy of the Ballad of Ho Chi Minh once the Vietnam War is over? At the same time, and relatedly, oppositional protests, so-called oppositional protests, had to paradox paradoxically uh, sorry, posit and define the very entity that it sought to negate inadvertently acknowledging and affirming that entity's authority in the very interventions that aimed to denounce it in the first place. Now, each of these phenomena presented a sort of trap for folk and its potentials. In light of this, we might understand Kagawa's disdain for what he called those raise your fist and yell things, not as a drift towards apoliticality, but rather as a recognition of the need to open up a space to do politics differently, and in the process, to save folk from itself. On the one hand, this meant not being tethered to and thus trapped by shifting historical contingencies. Now, on the other, it meant sidestepping the trap of generating the internal negation and thus the inadvertent legitimization of prevailing social and political conditions. Now, for Kagawa, both of these moves could be accomplished by scrambling, not negating, but scrambling some of the abiding conditions of modern everyday life, and thereby changing closed circuit questions a closed circuited questions based on negation into more open-ended ones based on reimagination. And what time I'll have left, I'll return to Kyokun Ichi in lesson one to uh, think about one way in which this played out. Now, there are facets of Kyokun Ichi that can be thought of as more or less straightforwardly anti-war. It's, it's insistence on running away and hiding, for example, that we see in the chorus, uh, in the face of state-sponsored violence, for instance, is what allowed Kyokun's US, its US distributor to proclaim the song a so-called life-affirming anti-war ballad in the first place. But the chief object of the work's critique is not war per se, but rather what Kagawa calls okuni, or the nation, as war's potentiating framework. It's not so much war that needs to be rethought, that is, as it is the nation itself and the terms of belonging within it. And given its ubiquity in modern life, this critical rethinking can only be accomplished by scrambling some of the ways that the nation is made to make sense in the first place. Now, this involves more than simply negating the nation or opposing it. In Kyokun Ichi, Kagawa accentuates and denaturalizes some of the normative terms and conditions of belonging in the nation in the first place, and suggests ways in which its potentially deadly embrace can be sidestepped altogether. Put simply, the very act of running away and hiding must be actualized by a body that is no longer suitable uh, to the nation's uses and can thus avoid being reappropriated into it. And for Kagawa, this move pivoted really strongly around telling stories of gender. 
Now I'd like you to consider in particular the, the song's third stanza, which it's my translation here, uh, but I put it up uh, highlighted with, with arrows. Offer up your life, be a man, they say. And when they do, then it's time, really time to start trembling. That's right, I'm perfectly happy as a woman. Being a rotten woman suits me just fine. Now, Kagawa has occasionally faced harsh criticism for his invocation of what the song calls the so-called rotten woman. The idiom in the original Japanese is one that is used to link women with certain character faults, implying that a man who is like a rotten woman, onna no kusata yona, is what the original idiom is, is inadequate or unmanly. Kagawa has been taken to task for repeating what is generally, and I think correctly, uh, understood to be a slur against women, and has been put on the defensive on multiple occasions. When he played the University of Chicago in October of 2016, for example, Kagawa changed this line at the very last moment from onna no kusatta to otoko no kusatta, or rotten man, likely out of fear of being misunderstood on the occasion of his first North American performance. Now, misogyny has been a very serious problem in Japan throughout the years of Kagawa's career, and the blowback that he faces for this line is understandable. But these criticisms, while well intended, largely fail to consider the actual utility of questions of gender in Kyokun Ichi as critique. And what some view as a lyrical shortcoming that is actually holds an important key to unpack the complexity of Kagawa's critical standard work and to its ongoing resonance across different historical moments. Now, scholars have shown how Japan as modern nation in its myriad incarnations, including as empire, has been deeply and indelibly gendered. Gender constitutes an important framework upon which different strategies for the nation's maintenance and expansion have been built and maintained, from gender divisions of labor aimed at reproducing capitalism in times of peace, to exhortations of, of, of sacrifice in times of war. Kagawa undermines uh, this framework by performing something, uh, sorry, excuse me, just for a second. Never trust technology. I'm glad I got a printout. Um, <laughs> sorry, let me restart. Uh, Kagawa undermines this framework by performing something of a productive impossibility. Uh, embodying and voicing uh, as a Japanese man an outright rejection of what it is meant, according to some, uh, to be a Japanese man in the first place, and misusing the very gendered assumptions that undergird and reinforce the nation to throw the entire narrative into question. Now, Kyoko Ichi makes tactical use of language uh, in order to unsettle the question uh, of the gender of the song's narrative voice. On the one hand, the we of the work is articulated as oretachi, uh, which is itself based in ore generally understood as a stereotypically masculine term for referring to the self. At the same time, though, the only time that I, presumably a component of uh, the we, makes an appearance in the work, it is, is, it is as atashi, a self-referential term closely associated with so-called feminine Japanese speech, according to linguists. Now, Japanese linguists also point out that sentence, sentence final particles like ne and yo are associated with feminized expression, and that purportedly polite forms of speech, such as those uh, deployed in these lyrics, also mark a gendered dividing line between the masculine and the feminine. When Kagawa calls on a purportedly masculine we to really start trembling, to let us live and be called stupid, he does so through a tactical deployment of feminized forms of expression, paving the way for Oretachi to become rotten women, even as this we remains Oretachi. In this way, Kagawa amplifies a gendered remix that undermines the binary gendered structures that reinforce both the nation and its internal negations. Yo Kagawa's tactic here, in short, seems to pivot around confounding the expectations placed by the nation upon both men and women by occupying the position of neither, or more specifically, both at the same time. The point here, though, and this is important, is not to simply flip the tables and embody the internal negation of the masculine by becoming woman. This has often been precisely the strategy pursued by hypermasculine sentimental nationalists in their attempts to become man and negate what they saw as a variously feminized and thus illegitimate post-war Japan. Rather, Kagawa steps beyond the frame entirely, becoming other, not merely becoming woman, but becoming a rotten woman. 
the impossibility that Kagawa performs, in other words, is the impossibility of remaining a Japanese man while rejecting both nation sanctioned terms of masculinity and its internal negation in sanctioned womanhood. This tactical distancing is, is achieved via his explicit citation and redeployment of the notion of the so-called rotten woman. In this work, I is not like a rotten woman, rather, I proudly takes on the very personage of the so-called rotten woman, becoming one. Being a rotten woman suits me just fine. Now, woman is yoked to the service of the nation in important ways too, just as man is. And appealing to gender to destabilize the nation is a really tricky line to walk. But Kagawa seems to solve this conundrum and destroy the binary it implies by becoming a figure who is doubly outside the norms of the nation, confounding the expectations placed upon his body as a fleshly component of the nation entirely. Kagawa's Kyokun Ichi, that is, helps turn some of the gendered expectations for being Japanese inside out. It's a masterful, critical performance that resonates strongly with what Butler has called gender trouble, the intentional performative confounding uh, of dominant gender norms, and the effect of this playful destabilization of refusing to engage the nation's use of gender, either through affirmation or through internal negation, is to urge a complete reimagining of what it means to live in the world and to run away and hide rather than stoking the flames of battle. Now, there's much more to say about Kagawa Ryo and his ethics of anti-folk, and I regret not having the time to share more with you. Just let me end these remarks. Uh, please let me end these remarks by saying that Kagawa's insistence on digging around at the roots of some of the phenomena that were the target of folks' protest around uh, 1970, rather than simply negating their surface manifestations, has allowed Kagawa and his critique to remain relevant far beyond the 1970s in ways that few others have. Kagawa vowed to sing Kyokuichi until he died. And in the end, that's exactly what happened. For as long as the nation remains a key sense-making mechanism of modern everyday life, there will always be a place for Kyokun and his critique within it. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. And apologies again for the technical difficulties. Thank you so much, Scott, for your presentation and indeed for this intricate textual, anal textual analysis that I think is very much needed <laughs> among the more contextual ones, historical ones that uh, can, you know, just sometimes become too overwhelming with new information. Uh, so uh, we have more, one more presentation. However, we don't have a presenter and but we decided to try to do it somehow uh, together to improvise to go through Lasse's uh, slides. Uh, uh, and well, about Lasse, who is unfortunately unable to join us today, Lasse Lehtonen, uh, he received his uh, PhD at the University of Helsinki in uh, 2018. Uh, and his research focuses on music and modern Japan, which ranges uh, from popular music and Western art music composition to video game music. And by combining approaches from musicology and Japanese studies, his research explores music in and as modern Japanese culture through a variety of perspectives, including cultural history, sociology, and music analysis. Uh, but this, these are actually his own words that I've, I've read out aloud, but I think he's being too modest because he, uh, uh, I believe he recently, uh, well, might have been two years now, he uh, wrote uh, quite a thick book, a popular book, like a history of Japanese music in Finnish, that was like a huge bestseller and uh, nominated to like a big uh, book prize as well. So he is uh, certainly an up and coming scholar. Um, uh, and uh, his presentation that his slides that we have uh, received uh, today uh, are here. Uh, so I, do you mind if I begin just by turning the pages and then whenever uh, Michael or Scott, when, whenever you feel uh, that you have something to add, please uh, uh, make it heard. Uh, so this is about uh, Matsuto Ayumi also. Well, she was Ara Ayumi in the beginning and Yumi is, uh, is usually, I mean, I probably a lot of you know about her, one of the most influential and, and famous Japanese 
uh, singers. Uh, and of course, the important thing is that she's not only a singer, but a singer songwriter. And this is something that really sets her apart uh, from a lot of uh, female uh, musicians who be, who came before her and she, she debuted in 1972 so she also fits in this uh, uh, time frame we have been we have been following today and has been accredited as a pioneering figure who revolutionized japanese popular music in uh, in quite many ways uh, one of them is uh, sophistication both musically and lyrically and uh, and she was also one of the first who was able to bridge uh, artistic ambitions and, and commercial aspirations, becoming very successful from early on. And, and also uh, by uh, her, uh, one of her contributions is the, the establishment of the very category of female uh, singer-songwriters. Uh, and, uh, but a larger question here is that how, how, will we, how should we place Yumin within uh, this idea or concept or label of, of new music. Uh, let's see. Uh, and new music, uh, of course, uh, we, we already had a bit of a discussion about it the other day uh, in, a, in a different panel. Uh, so in the 1970s, um, it's, it's not something that you, you can you know, put your finger on exactly. Uh, so it's, it's a loose, uh, it's, it's also loose amalgamation of, of different musical styles and uh, uh, artist images and then the production model. So it kind of all works together. So uh, do you have anything to add? I mean, I could hear uh, someone's mic going off there. Uh, no. So, uh, so uh, there is, uh, for one thing, there is stylistic diversity to this uh, genre if it can be called a genre and there is certainly a focus on on singer songwriters so um, kind of authorship and authenticity and individual creatorship and also integrity that comes with with these ideas uh, on the other hand it is still uh, unabashedly i might say a commercial uh, genre or or way of uh, musicking uh, producing music uh, and uh, it, it has collaborated with also the, the, the term, dreaded term for some kaiokyoku industry. Uh, so it's very much part of mainstream media. Uh, but on, on a different level, uh, in, a, in a broader social context, this also relates to a lot of things that were happening in the 90s, the crucial things that were happening in Japan in the 1970s. You have urbanization, uh, rapid urbanization, uh, economic boom, a rise of of consumerism uh, and, and also this uh, very famous uh, uh, dictum about Japan having become a middle-class society. On the other hand, there is uh, the first uh, wave of, uh, well, not the first wave, I think it's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting my feminism right. I mean, <laughs> guys, help me. Which wave of feminism can we talk about in Japanese context in the 1970s? Should be the second, shouldn't it be? Because yeah, I, I was thinking, yeah, that because you know it's just, it can't be the first, so it's probably the second. Uh, so again, I'm just riffing here because I have no idea what Lasse would have would have said had he been here. Uh, and uh, and this is kind of uh, uh, an introduction uh, to to this uh, topic of of gender in the case of new music. Uh, and as Yumin was someone who popular, popularized the category of women uh, singer-songwriters in Japan, although she was not the creator of it, uh, Itsu Amayumi, for instance, uh, uh, came before her, and, and also Taniyama Hiroko and Kosaka Akiko, uh, then the, the first Yumin boom was uh, uh, the first notable, the first large-scale rise of female singer-songwriters then in, in the mid-1970s. Um, and it was a momentous change. Uh, there was, uh, on the one hand, there was a large scale introduction of women's voices in popular music and production. And, and also this had an impact on uh, young women audiences. And I'm not quite sure what Lasse means about this uh, uh, third thing, uh, that there was this uh, new brand of uh, authenticity that had, uh, mm, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure, so I, I, will, I will not guess. I will just, you know, leave everyone to make their own uh, conclusions from, from this. Um, and uh, she clearly, she was this very, pre very much present in mass media, uh, becoming an icon for for young women, 
And in her own words, uh, she said in 1984, a bit later, perhaps I represent pack stage women's liberation. Uh, and, and there are several writers who have uh, written about Yumin's uh, phenomenon, uh, as like saying her that among one thing, uh, among other things, that uh, her significance for contemporary young women uh, is an example of a highly successful individual. Uh, and well, she she can't uh, you mean can't really be labeled as a or under considered as a as a feminist position uh, that she had did not have an open uh, uh, agenda to fight for equality among genders. Mm. And I'm not quite sure what the next thing means. Uh, if any one of you would like to help me, or we can just. Um, uh, go on and maybe uh, leave it for discussion later on. Uh, so I mean, here Lasse has provided us uh, some kind of a map uh, of, um, of how uh, initially what, what was political activism of the new left in the 1960s eventually you know, led to, let's say, humans phenomenon, among other things. Uh, so and it's kind of branching out to this. On the one hand, there is radical feminism or the women's liberation movement. On the other hand, there is political engaged folk that uh, Scott was uh, talking about quite in detail a moment ago. Uh, and it, it also related to new uh, production and uh, 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 dissemination models. Uh, and one of the representatives of uh, where, where these two things uh, come together is actually another singer by the name of Kobayashi Mariko. Um, eventually, the radical feminism uh, has, did become liberal feminism uh, and also as a, as a commercial media trend, while the politically engaged folk uh, have transformed uh, to this uh, um, trend to this phenomenon of women singers songwriters in within this larger uh, idea of uh, or the genre or uh, kind of a template uh, to produce and consume music called new music um, and 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 here is a, a demarcation uh, line uh, that where you on the, on the one hand we have this political activism uh, and and then there is the commercialization in in time of of these um, the trends that follow from there um, and in, in, in a sense, these uh, new music uh, women singers songwriters did uh, embody the goals of, of liberal feminism. Uh, and, and here we have uh, two big uh, terms that I think will always be uh, discussed when we, we talk about popular music. Uh, on the one hand, there is commercialism and then there is authenticity and the kind of incongruity of, of these two, while these while they um, always seem to uh, be opposing each other while 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 existing together um, and then here are some uh, theorists uh, who have said about pop commercializ commercialization commercialism in, in popular music as inauthenticity and degraded aesthetic value mm. and um, I think some of this probably will have you know links to what what Scott was talking about uh, earlier <clears throat> and there is also Brian and Gina Coogan Kogan, uh, and who have um, pointed out that commercialism uh, is, uh, as women's authenticity in, in Japanese popular music. Um, and there is particularly about the humans brand of uh, authenticity, which uh, comprised uh, nego on the one hand negotiating stereotypically feminine uh, and, uh, and masculine uh, attributes, uh, thereby establishing an original brand of authenticity. And uh, as for conclusions, uh, new music uh, in what, what is new uh, in new you means new music uh, that it is all linked to certain developments in post-war Japanese society, particularly uh, in the 1970s, I believe, uh, which in, in turn relate to the popularization of a female singer-songwriter as a kind of label, uh, and. Uh, what really remains from all this uh, are the complexities of genre, authenticity, authorship, and gender in Japanese popular music. I, I do hope that I was able to uh, do some justice to, <laughs> on behalf of Lasse. Uh, and I, I'm glad to say that actually uh, the article that is mentioned here that just came out very recently in a very influential and important popular music journal uh, is actually discussing a lot of these same issues. So if this felt like a very truncated uh, walkthrough of his slides, then uh, 
uh, please look for this article and and find out more. And also, uh, Lasse is in the process of uh, completing a book uh, on uh, Yumin's. Uh, well, this the fourteenth moon. That's one of her early albums, uh, and this will be forthcoming from Bloomsbury Academic uh, uh, next year. So uh, I would like to thank you for listening on behalf of uh, Lasse. Hope this wasn't too terrible, that his ghost is not <laughs> going to take revenge upon me when I go to sleep later today. Uh, uh, and uh, Michael, do you think you could run the other Michael's uh, discussion video now? Because we have another okay. ghost joining us. Yeah, I'm Laurie. Um, this session I in... Think I think uh, unless, I mean, Annegret and Catherine, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the last session today. So are yes. we able to go a bit over time? Yes, just go ahead. And okay. um, maybe we have to skip the question and answers section um, to maybe a wonder session uh, tomorrow. Or you leave well, I mean the or you go right away to question and answer because you are running out in four minutes because um he wrote those comments for us and i think they're pertinent to us but i think we should use what limited time we have to get you know we've got yes. so many yeah. music people in the audience yes yeah. good to hear from Bravo. them Bravo. yes Bravo. let's do this yeah very yeah. good so go ahead i so think go ahead, i people who put that. their hands Thank up and you. You use Put your hands down. So I saw several hands up. Go ahead. Uh, Anybody? Yeah, I can see uh, Amber and Tu Min. Amber, why don't you go ahead? Okay, thank you very much. Um, very interesting panel, very interesting presentations. I'll say that first. Um, I wanted to uh, say something about in the last presentation, we were seeing this thing of uh, women's media. I'm kind of unsure what it would mean. And I thought I maybe have a guess what could have to do with it. Because um, I did my bachelor thesis about emancipation of uh, female singers in Japan in the 70s and 80s through their song lyrics. And part of the research concerned some things I read about um, up and coming magazines for women. And the image uh, these magazines created of um, things that were really um, for uh, like a free woman who is not, um, doesn't necessarily want to get married right away or stuff like that and um, want to do things for herself. And there were like interviews with free thinkers, but also like seeing images of idols for example with a um, slightly more progressive image without being explicitly feminist they kind of contributed to this new atmosphere of uh, things for women without any kind of male perspective in there which helped that emancipation so i thought maybe it had something to do with that that part of the slide thank you Thank you very much for uh, guessing what Lasse might have been talking about. I certainly wasn't able to. Tu Min, you got a question? Uh, yes. Um, excuse me. It's just a short question to Professor Scott Alger. Um, I'm curious about the fan base of Kagawa Yo. Um, uh, on the perspective of, you know, political affiliation, gender, and also might be interesting to know uh, their folk affiliation, whether they share this, uh, whether he shares the same fans as uh, other folk singers that he seemingly didn't really uh, enjoy being compared to. 
Right, right. No, that's a great question. Um, Kagawa was, Kagawa performed um, uh, hundreds of shows every year uh, throughout his entire career, uh, right up until he died. Um, one of his last shows uh, was at the uh, University of Chicago in, in, at the end of 2016. Uh, and he went back and played two shows in Japan uh, and was stricken with leukemia and died not, not, not long after. Um, and, you know, I had the, the, the opportunity to, to take in a lot. Uh, of, of, of his shows and his performances. Um, and uh, his uh, fan base, his, um, the people who come out to his shows are really diverse in terms of age, uh, in terms of gender. Uh, I think it's probably somewhere around half-half uh, in terms of gender. Uh, in terms of age, more older people than younger people. Uh, there is, however, a, a, a sort of a neo-folk boom uh, going on in Japan right now. Uh, acts like Hambato Hambato, uh, who, who have been really uh, sort of strongly influenced by folks like Kagawa, are re-releasing some of his songs uh, and, uh, you know, but, but fueling up a new younger fan base for him. Um, political affiliation, it's been my experience talking to uh, you know his fans, um, and I introduced a number of them in my book. Not to, to put in another sort of side PR for my book here, but if you're interested, please take a look. Um, it, it, his fans tend to be um, interested in reimagining uh, questions of social life. Uh, what it can mean to live in Japan, not rejecting the idea of Japan, but recalibrating it. Um, but he has um, sort of this idea of what he calls Japan's one more time, Nihon no Moichido, uh, the idea of being able to sort of recalibrate what Japan means. Um, so his, you know, the, 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 I don't think there's any way to really pigeonhole or pin down uh, what his fan base is all about. But that's, you know, one of the, uh, what, what, one of the beauties about the artist. Um, as far as the other people, um, the other uh, folk artists, um, you know, we, we do have to take what he's doing with a grain of salt. Um, he was great friends with Okabayashi no Oyasu. Um, you know, one of the first shows he ever went to was Takaishi Tomoya. Uh, you know, he's, he's, he's not going to go out and like pick a fight with these guys on the street. Um, you know, but th there is a certain amount of performativity in trying to put a distance between him and some of the work that these other folks are doing. Um, but at the same time, while he does have, have respect uh, for their art, he is also interested in, again, putting that distance in between sort of his approach to folk and others and saying, no, you know, I'm not the same. I want to do something different. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else with questions? Oh yes, thank you Moritz for uh, adding a link to Loss's article. He will probably get a much better idea from there. And also, if you if you don't feel like asking a question in person, you can also write it in the chat. I mean, our, our, uh, yes, uh, Moritz. Uh... Hello. Uh, can you hear me? I have yes. a question that is perhaps a bit specific for uh, Michael. Yeah. If you're interested, so it's um, it really relates to Johnny's early involvement in musical and theater culture that you that you touched upon. Yeah. You know, I've been uh, looking into this mid 1960s musical called uh, Hono no Kabu, Flaming mm -hmm. Curves, or however yeah. you translate it. Uh, that was performed at the Nisei Gekijo, and it featured you know the first generation uh, Johnny's band. Yes. I believe, but the title song was written by Ishihara Shintaro yeah, and yeah. Uh, was actually performed by uh, the Spiders, so a group sounds band. So it was really an, an early and a, a quite fascinating uh, meeting of, uh, you know, several strands of uh, post-war uh, pop music. So I've been trying to, to look into this uh, musical, but I've had a hard time finding good sources. I wonder if you could I, place I wrote it. it or... my, my article, which is yeah. in recent date. I have You're... an article which yeah. is with the same title as today's presentation, and it has a paragraph on that musical with all the information that I have been able to retrieve. So I'll send it to you. That's everything. OK. Yeah. I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? I mean, our, our time is up, but we will continue. Um. <laughs> uh, Kathy do you have anything yeah i don't i'm i'm trying to figure out how to put it into words 
but... that's always that's the trick you know <laughs> <laughs> um but i mean uh, i guess one specific thing is i i can't remember right now but someone i maybe it was johnny or someone but you mentioned queerness and you mentioned you know the sort of gayness and i'm very curious about that coming from the that generation and and also um you know queen and a lot of turbulence going on there um but what is is really interesting to me and i'm trying to this is where i'm trying to figure it out um is you all have this relationship to politics and then there's a sort of slide away from it and there's there's something that happens that goes into uh loss all right and not just loss of youth or, you know, whatever, or being, you know, famous or that kind of thing. But I'm very curious about that because, you know, you look at, if you look at Buto, if you look at manga, you look at uh, other um, popular, unpopular culture, um, riding through uh, the 60s into the 70s, then, you know, what, what are ways you might read um, this work of the 70s? Um, from that sort of high or turbulence of the of the seventies, and not that I want to reclaim, uh, you know, something, but I'm just I am very curious um, what you any what you might say about that. Yeah, um, and also I'm very wary of keeping Japan just Japan. Um, and there was I'm trying to think of the the name of this, but that's the guy who wrote. Um, yellow music um, on Chinese and Taiwanese pop during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. He's a professor at, at Cal, actually. But he looked at the record, right, and the album and traced albums and records across East Asia, how they were bought and sold. So I would love to see you guys extend or consider um, the, the leakage of your work um, beyond Japan, yeah. Okay, those are three things and let's just keep going. <laughs> I would suggest that we end the session in 10 minutes yeah. at uh, yeah. half past. We can go into the- yeah. Just for, for the sake of- uh, I think, You know, we can go into the wonder we, I think- oh, yeah. Yes, the wonder is up, definitely. So how do you do the wonder thing, actually? I, I, can, I, I will send again the uh, link to it. Just a second. Just give me a when second. It gets complicated. You're going to see your head floating around the room. <laughs> it's not, it's not complicated. Your mouse. Um, actually, you because think? this is the last session, so it's completely the wonder okay off? to stay on. Okay, so no wonder session. Then uh, maybe it's completely yeah. okay. Yes, if you feel more comfortable to use okay, a Zoom, so it's, it's completely it's, okay. Yeah. Okay. Here. Yeah, I don't want okay. my head floating anywhere. So yeah, <laughs> this is fine. So for those who can come, we'll see you there. And uh, I'd like to thank a whole bunch of music people who came to see us: uh, Yuika Saba, of course Moritz, uh, and uh, Matsuoka Sensei, and uh, Aurel and Anita. Uh, among others who are all working in music. We look forward to seeing you on other panels, maybe with us. So thanks for coming. Yes. And Thank if you, you want to, you want to come in, wonder, wonder me, then uh, we'll see you there. For some reason, it's made wonderments. But anyhow, this is uh, the, the correct. And please use Google Chrome. If you, yeah, you have to use Google Chrome. It won't work with that. Otherwise, it wouldn't work out. Yeah. See, okay, I have Chrome. <laughs> okay, so I think we will close the meeting then. Ooh. Thank Unless you so very much. Yeah. Oh, and Thank we'll you. see you all tomorrow or today, depending upon your <laughs> life plan. Tomorrow or today, yes. <laughs> Our tomorrow, your, your today. <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, and I'm looking forward to more just hearing and be, you know, being in association with your work and you guys, fantastic. Um, just, I just want to make it, you know, blossom and, and bleed and go different directions. It's great. Thank you all so much. Thank you all very much. Thank, very much you. For having Thank us. you very much. Great panel. See you. See you tomorrow. 
all today. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Michael Burdash. I'm speaking to you from my office at the University of Chicago. I have to apologize for being unable to participate live in the discussion today. I'm sorry that I'll miss the Q&A session, but I hope in the next 10 minutes or so to throw out some comments and questions that will bring the papers in dialogue and trigger some productive discussions. I have to start by thanking Lori Kitsnick for organizing the panel and to the four presenters for sending me their papers ahead of time. Now, what struck me in reading all four of these fine papers is that they all take up in different ways and from different angles, what we might call the stickiness of music. The way that, that historical contexts, both personal and shared, stick to pieces of music and to the places, performers, and rituals that we associate with music. For example, I can't hear the song, My Best Friend's Girlfriend by the new wave band, The, the Cars, without remembering my 1979 senior prom in high school. And likewise, I can't hear the Taiwanese singer Joanna Wong's 2008 debut album, Start From Here, without thinking about my mother's death from that same year. These associations between certain songs and, and past experiences are involuntary. I don't consciously choose to think about these past experiences when I hear the songs, but rather, as soon as I recognize the song when I hear it, those memories come flooding back in, whether I want them to or not. And as we all know, this stickiness involves both personal and shared social memories. For, for a large segment of her fandom, for example, the music of Teresa Tang is always going to summon up memories of Tiananmen Square in 1989. Now this stickiness of popular music is in part physiological. It's written into our bodies through things like our mirror neurons which cause us to mirror back certain motor actions that we witness in the world around us, and which help explain why lullabies and other songs are such important parts of early childhood development. But the stickiness is also in part social and historical. Shared experiences, particularly intense experiences, stick to music so that the music becomes an integral part of our shared memory of those experiences. And in fact, the stickiness is social and historical because it is embodied. And it's embodied because it is social and historical. Our embodied sensorium and sensibility are themselves products of the social and historical orders in which we live and through which we negotiate our lives and our relations with the world. So things like class hierarchies, racialization, sexuality and gender, historical violence, and historical euphoria are all inscribed in our bodies, in part through music and the forms of pleasure and displeasure it triggers in us. Now, we see this kind of stickiness in all four of the papers. Kagawa Ryo can't stand to be called a folk singer because of the pastness that sticks to that form of music. The audience at the Kyodai Seibu Kodo booed the band The Police off the stage in 1980 because of the pastness that sticks to that specific musical venue. Likewise, Johnny's Jumusho boy bands from the 1970s arrive with a residue of the experiences of Johnny Kitagawa as an interned and then repatriated Japanese American in wartime and early post-war Japan in Los Angeles, as well as his experiences as a closeted gay man. And in Lhasa Letolin's paper on New Ming, what makes new music new is precisely a reaction against certain kinds of stickiness. So let me make a few comments on each of the paper and then ask each of the presenters a question that is inspired by the other papers on the panels. So I'll start with Lori Kitsnik on uh, Kyodo Seibu Kodo and its particular history in relationship to political activism and community organizing. Um, that venue has a stickiness that picks up legends and myths that a responsible scholar has to sort through. Popular music attracts fictional mythic moments, uh, like the one Scott Allgaard just talks about when Kagawa Ryo was suddenly born as a singing star. And as scholars, we have to separate the fictional myths from what really happened in the past or try to separate them. Uh, and yet we also have to remember that the myths themselves become part of history that they have a real historical impact, even though they may be fictional. Now, Lori's was the only of the four papers not to focus on gender. And I thought that might be an interesting question to raise. My uninformed guess is that Kyodai Seibu Kodo was a largely masculine realm, but perhaps I'm wrong. But my question is, how was this space gendered? And how did that impact the kinds of memories that stuck to it or didn't stick to it? Next, let me turn to Lassie Letelman. Uh, 
his paper shows how gender is in many ways the key to understanding how Matsutoya Yumi negotiated a new mode of authenticity that could engage with the commercial side of popular music while sidestepping accusations of having sold out. Newman presents an instance of how production, reproduction, and consumption are all gendered as socioeconomic activities. In particular, the gendering of consumption as a feminine activity became for Yuming a kind of enabling possibility. It allowed her a new way to engage with commercialism in her music. The key to all of this, uh, according to Lassa, was newness. Yuming as a songwriter was a new model in that she wrote the material she performs. And when a female artist engaged in this form of production, she was able to escape certain charges of inauthenticity, even as she engaged uh, with the market. My question for Lassa is this, was the newness of Yuming's new music entirely new or was it in some ways a myth that was used to conceal connections to older uh, pre-existing models and forms? In other words, is the newness of 1970s new music in some ways an ideological myth? Next, let me turn to Scott Allgaard. Uh, his paper gives us a terrific explanation of Kagawa Ryo's struggles with all the stereotypes and ideological stances that got stuck to the genre of folk music. And, and Scott described in, in really uh, uh, useful ways how Kagawa struggled for a different model of authenticity. I noticed that, that Scott's was the only paper on the panel that didn't deal with the business side of the music business. And what about the business side? Kagawa, as Scott notes, before he was a performer, worked in the music business. Now, as he, as he became a musical singer and songwriter, was the commercial side of music a source of struggle for him or not? And why? Did he share folks anti-commercialism? Or like Matsutoya Yumi, was he able to negotiate a new kind of relationship between his music and commercialism? Finally, uh, let me uh, take up Michael Fermanowski's paper, which shows us how Johnny Kitagawa's apparent failure to negotiate the cultural divide that opened up in 1970s uh, Japan, uh, an inability to negotiate new tensions that emerged between authenticity and commercialism, uh, this inability uh, ironically set the stage for the enormous success his office would have in dominating Japanese pop in later decades, preparing the way for today's K-pop. I was struck in reading the paper by the centrality of dance and choreography to Johnny's model of pop music, and also by the centrality of fashion. Uh, the images of band uniforms and hairstyles are really striking and, and reinforce the, the centrality of, of the visual element in, in Johnny's brand of popular music. Michael touches on the importance of a new kind of gendering of, of male idols. A new generation of male idols arose in the 1970s that signaled androgyny or even femininity in their fair, hairstyle, clothing, lyrics, and singing style. Now, Michael in the paper stresses uh, Kitagawa's inability to really grasp the new modes of authenticity and style that emerged and defined mainstream 1970s popular music. But I have to wonder if he wasn't at the same time modeling alternative modes of authenticity that would ultimately prove successful. I'm thinking here of John Lee's book on K-pop and his discussion there of the authenticity of K-pop. Do we need to think about Johnny's brand of popular music as generating its own modes of authenticity? And finally, I want to ask all the panelists their thoughts about the implications of being Japan studies scholars, if they accept that label, who focus on popular music. A part of our job as scholars of popular music is to clarify the forms of historical stickiness that accompany popular music in Japan, particularly as we explain that music to readers and listeners from elsewhere. We also have to think about how that stickiness changes when the music circulates beyond its original place in time. I'd also like to reflect on what it means to do this in different places and different times. When Michael and Laurie as European or North American scholars based in Japan do this kind of scholarship, how is it different from when Lasse does this in Finland or Scott does it in America? What forms of historical stickiness become salient in their specific contexts and why? And we also have to keep think about not just where and when scholarship takes place, but also who carries out the scholarship. And just, I will point out that, for instance, the gender of the scholar is, is an important issue. 
Um, this is an all male panel, which of course brings certain kinds of limitations. Let me conclude by uh, referring to Christopher Small's book, Musicy, where he argues that when we enjoy music, what we're really enjoying is an idealized image of our own relationships with the world. And so as, as scholars of Japanese popular music, part of our job is trying to grasp the idealized visions of relationships with the world that provided pleasure to the original audience back in the 1970s. But as Japan studies scholars, we also need to reflect about our own pleasures and displeasures and think about what implicit ideal relationships we are modeling in our own enjoyment of this music. So I'll stop here and wish you a lively and productive discussion of these uh, rich papers. And I look forward to the days when the pandemic is over and we can do this in person. Thank you.